so we're we're in this uh, series about anxiety, and I'm I'm so happy to hear from many of you that all of your anxieties have been <coughs> solved, and that you have no anxiety anymore. And I'm just making this up, <laughs> in case there was any clue. Of course, we have anxiety, and we're going to go through a time together. And this is maybe the, the oddest one of all, but it's me, right? Conquering, overcoming anxiety that's hand-delivered by God. Does that sound odd? Because, you know, God is the author of goodness and mercy and forgiveness and blessings and healings. Could God actually hand-deliver anxiety? And that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to see just about would he do it, why he would do it, and what are we supposed to do with it? And as start off, remember our, defi our working definition of anxiety, right? We got pieces. All God's children got pieces. But when we try to fix it ourselves, when we try to put the puzzle of our lives together, that's what generates anxiety, because where does it all fall? On you and me. And, and we weren't designed to do it. We were designed as little children. When I fell and scraped my knee, I wasn't supposed to fix it myself, right? I ran to mom. Boy, could I, I, could, I could generate some crocodile tears. That was great. So we're going to look at this. And we're going to be, if you have your Bible or want to know where this all comes from, it comes from Mark 4, and we have Jesus, and Jesus is giving a sermon. And I, I just love listening to Jesus' sermons or reading them because they're so interesting. They're so great. And he gives this sermon about the parable of the sower and the parable of the lost coin, the mustard seed, you know, all these Beautiful pictures, aren't they great? They are, they're terrific, and we could spend so much time on them, and Jesus gives all this great teaching, all this great information to his disciples and to the people all around him. But you know what? Jesus is not satisfied. Jesus is not satisfied in us taking in information. Jesus is not satisfied with us going through a course. Jesus is not satisfied with us reading the Bible. As good as those things are, he's not satisfied to stay there because he wants to know, did it stick? Did we really catch it? Did it really sink in? And has it changed us? Jesus wants to know whether what he has told us has stuck. And th this is how he hand delivers anxiety. Because he hands it out and says, okay, boys and girls, what are you going to do with it? And so right after, right after this great sermon, right after all these people coming out of church and trying to figure out which restaurant to go to, after coming out of this great Bible exposition seminar, Jesus turns to his disciples and says that when evening came, he said to his disciples, what does he say? Let's go to the other side. The other side. I mean, we've been here for all this time. We've been here at least all day. And now it's the end of the day. And rather than hit the rewind button and say, oh, I want to replay that message. No, he says, let's go from here to there. He says to his disciples, let's go. It's not, he doesn't say, you go over there. He says, who go over there? Us. Us. So who's coming along? Us. Jesus. Jesus is giving instruction and he's saying, in the words of where I come from, yo, sco, sco. That means let us go. And that's what he says. He says, let us go. And, you know, we think about this for a moment. I want you to just really 
chew on this for a moment. He said, what's the idea? What's the idea Jesus says to them? We're going to do what? Go, right? We're going to leave here and go somewhere else. And whose idea was it? It was Jesus' idea. It wasn't one of the disciples who was Googling and searching and saying, hey, you know, there's a great place on the other side of the, of the, of the lake that we can sit down and have dinner. No, it's Jesus' idea to cross the sea. And was it God's will? Was it God's will for them to go from where they were over to the other side of the sea. What do you think? He wouldn't have done it unless it was God's will. He, it, God. he, is, God. he is God. So if God tells us to do it, do it, it's pretty straightforward, right? I mean, that's it. Jesus says, do it. That's the answer. Yes, this is God's will. And so you don't have to sit there. Have, have you ever been in those times in your life where you say, Oh, dear God, that's the way I pray. Oh, dear God, is this your will? Have you ever prayed that prayer? Do you know there are times in life that we don't have to pray that prayer? There are things he's already told us what to do. So do I need to pray about those things? No. Do I need to pray, dear God, should I be loving towards my neighbor today? even though they've been a stink bomb. Do I need to pray about that? No. No. Do I need to be a giving person? No. He has given, so in response, and Jesus says this is one of those times. There are times we need to pray. Absolutely. But this isn't one of them. Jesus says we're going from here, and we're going over there, and that's going to be it. But Jesus, remember, he's, he has gone through a whole day of teaching, of being with people. Have you ever been with people all day? How do you feel at the end of the day? Tired. Bye. Exhausted. Exhausted. I used to be in sales and be, go to conferences with thousands of people and speak and make presentations. And at the end of the day, they always had these cocktail hours and dinners where you stood around and talked with finger food. I just wanted to go to my room and order one of those lousy pizzas that they serve in the, I didn't care. I just wanted to be alone. And Jesus is exhausted because how, look, at, look at how what it says about him. He says, did Jesus go by himself? No, what happened? They took him along. Maybe he needed help. Can you think of another time in Jesus' life when he needed help? Carrying his cross. Remember? The God of the universe in human form, fully God, fully man, needed help. And, they, and he was willing to receive it. Is that hard for you? Is that hard for you to receive help? Is it hard for you when somebody comes up and says, let me help you? And you say, oh, no, nah, I don't need help. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm an American guy. You know, we don't need any help. I'm that great individual. I'm Thomas Jefferson. I don't need anybody. But Jesus needed help and he received it. And he didn't receive it with an attitude say, oh, okay. No, he received it. He received the help, and they take him along, and it says, just as he was. He was exhausted. There was no need to pack. There was no need to gather things up. He said, it's time to go. Have you ever had to do that? Have you ever had to pick up and go right then and there? What's that like? Frustration? And you wonder what's at the other end. Marian's, I was on the phone with Marian's mom one day and 
she, uh, her dad was sick and they were trying to do it on his, Bill had had, had a series of very small strokes and had lost partial sight, couldn't drive. And Kate had to take on all these responsibilities. And everybody, the kids, everybody offered, no, no, we're okay. So I call Kate up and I'm talking to her and you hear that, you hear her voice. You ever hear something in, a, in somebody's voice when they're not saying the words, but they're saying something behind, behind the words? And so I say, Kate, is everything okay? And there was a pause. There's never a pause with Kate. Well, you know, we are struggling. Well, Kate, do you think you could use some help? Another pause. Yeah, I think we could use some help. I said, Kate, what do you think about the idea of Marianne coming up to give you some help? Oh, that would be great. Now, Marion wasn't there. She was, I think she was still teaching at the time. So she comes back, she comes home. It's now around noon. She comes home. I tell her what happened. She calls her mom. And at 3 p.m., her, she and her car leave. And she drives. She goes. Not much time to pack or think. That's what's going on here. Not much time. And they get in the boat, but notice, are they alone? There's a, there's a whole fleet. There's a whole bunch of boats out there. And so here he is, and he's gone out, and let's be clear about something. They are smack dab in the center of God's will. And yet Jesus is so tired, he needs help. They're right right in the absolute center, the bullseye of God's will. And something's about to happen. You see, we think if I'm in the center of God's will, right? Smooth sailing, right? The road, you know, all the red lights are going to turn green before I get there, right? And somebody's going to open up and say, oh, please come on into the line. No, it doesn't work like that. They were with Jesus, right? Fully God, fully man. And the disciples are right. They have been with him all day and they're still with him. And they heard Jesus. They heard all of his sermons. They heard all of his messages. He heard the, they heard him say, we're going to the other side of the sea. And guess what? They listened and obeyed. They heard Jesus and they said, okay, we're gone. Let's do this. They're right smack dab in the will of God. And they went with Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is right there. It's not like Jesus says, you go over there and I'll catch up. No, Jesus is right there with them. And he was there physically and spiritually, fully God, fully man, right there in their midst, right there in the same boat. And all hell breaks loose because, and as you think, we think, well, this, here's what Corey Ten Boone said. The safest place to be is in the center of God's will. And Corey is right. It is safe. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's easy because they leave in the absolute center of God's will. Jesus is right there with them. They're doing exactly what Jesus told them to do and what happens next? Storm. Not just a storm, a furious squall. This, this is some video footage from the Sea of Galilee when one of these like storms happened, okay? Uh, and so the waves are breaking over the boat. Now, let's talk about the boats that they have here, ladies and friends. You know, these are not cabin cruisers, okay? These aren't yachts, okay? These are like 27 feet long. They've actually uncovered one of these things. It's about 27 feet long. It's about five and a half feet wide. And do you know what a keel is on a boat? 
What's the keel? It's the pointy part, right? It goes in the water. When the boat sinks in the water, the keel holds it, right? These boats don't have a keel. It's like a canoe. So how do you think a canoe is going to get pushed around in something like this? And it's not, it's so big, they are nearly swamped. What does it mean to be swamped? Taking a lot of water. A lot of water. A lot of water. Enough water to do what? Sink you. Turn you over. They, and here they're swamped. They got the storm, they got the waves, they got the wind, and where are they? In the center of God's will. They haven't gone off course. They haven't done something that Jesus didn't say. They're following exactly what Jesus said to do, and now they're in this storm. They were in the will of God right after church. Just this, they had this great sermon, all of these messages, all of these illustrations. And Jesus says, did it stick? Let's find out. You see, there are storms when it comes to the will of God. There are storms when it comes to the will of God. This is not very popular to talk about. Because they want to say, if I'm in the will of God, what's going to happen? Everything's going to be okay. You're going to get the check. You're going to get the girl. You're going to get the guy. You're going to get the house. You're going to get the car. You're going to get the healing. But in the will of God, there are times when we're doing exactly what we're supposed to be doing. And God sends along a storm. You see... Storms, guess what? Who controls the storm? Do you? No, you're out of control. When a storm comes up, you're out of control. Also, how strong is the storm? Do you control that? Do you control the length of how long it's going to be around? No, and you can be in the middle of the will of God and be experiencing a storm. Being in the will of God does not guarantee you that you're going to make it, that you're even going to live through it. Being in the will of God does not say storms go bye-bye. Storms don't tell you if you're in the will of God or not. You can't look at a storm and say, oh, I must have done something wrong. Maybe the storm comes because you've done something right. And God's saying, I want to stick, I want to see. And storms aren't pleasant. Storms aren't fun. And so Jesus is in this boat, and I just love, this is just so practical. It, this has got to be true. Because, you know, here's Jesus in this boat, and what is he doing? Sleeping. He's sleeping. <laughs> and the boat is being tossed all over the place. What does that tell you about Jesus? Heavy sleeper. He's a heavy sleeper. <laughs> He's not a worrier. Maybe he is just so exhausted. Just he, Remember, Jesus is, a, is fully man. He gets tired. He gets thirsty. He gets hungry. When somebody touches him from behind, he turns around and says, what? Who touched me? He's fully... He, they say, when is God going to do this? And what is Jesus' answer? When God the, Father, God the Father knows, but I don't. He's fully God, fully man. He is so exhausted. It says, it says a cushion. I just love this. You th when you think of a cushion, what do you think of? Pillow. A pillow. You think about the chairs you're sitting on, right? That's a, that's, that's a cushion. No. This was like, in a sailboat, they got like 
a piece of they have a piece of wood that you sit up that's not on the floor on the floor but just something that it's up off the floor so you're not in the water on the bottom and what do they say teacher don't you care if we drown that's just so honest isn't it have you prayed that prayer maybe you weren't going down in water but maybe you were headed down in somewhere else in something else that was taking you down and you cried out to God God don't you care don't you care if we drowned don't you think that I'm worth it because when we're drowning what's our instinct to do something to fix it on our own right yeah I do it's like the, my friend here I'm going to show you a short video of a guy who's having a problem and he decides to try to fix it himself <laughs> Isn't that sometimes how life happens? We try to fix it. We think we're doing a good job. I mean, it's logical, but it just comes crashing down on us. That's where the disciples are. Yeah, they, were this, they had been with Jesus years, and they had just come off this great Bible exposition, this great time of Bible teaching, and they're with Jesus, the storm comes up and say, oh Jesus, don't you care? And he comes along and the thing I love about Jesus is that he doesn't dump on them, does he? He doesn't say, huh, you failed this test, get out right now, jump out of the boat. Or when we get to land, you're done. No, he doesn't dump on them, and maybe we shouldn't either, because he gets up. So if he gets up, what's that mean? He was lying down, right? He was laying down, and he gets up, and he does what to the wind? He rebukes it and says, quiet and be still. This idea of rebuking is the idea of the storm is out of control, right? He says, not anymore. You're under my control. He takes, he takes it up. He takes care of it. And when he says, be still and be quiet, it's like muzzling a dog. You know, what do you do? What happens when you muzzle a dog? It can't bark, it can't bark right? He muzzles the storm. He muzzles the wind. He muzzles the waves. And he stops them. And the wind calmed down. And it was not just a little quiet. It was completely calm. It was completely calm. You know, we need sometimes to pay attention to Jesus and say, yeah, I really want it to stick because what I've been doing is trying to take control of everything. It's like what happened, there was a pastor's conference and behind, you know, behind when there's a speaker, there's a lectern and behind them they have these big signs, you know, usually some big, you know, Bible verse or something. Here's what was behind this one particular sermon, uh, pastors. Relax everybody, for once you're not in charge. Maybe that was true for those pastors, and maybe that should be true for you and me. Maybe it should be true for you and me. For once, will I let God be God? For once, will I let him be in charge? Relax. When we do that, we're turning over the anxiety to him. We're saying, God, you're going to take care of this. 
you must be the one who takes care of it. So after this all happens, he turns, it's now calm, he turns to the disciples and he says to them, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? You just heard all of these great illustrations, the ser sermon about faith, of trusting God, of trusting me. And right away, here's a storm. And it's like short-term memory loss. It's gone. It, they, they lost it. He, they, they, he asked the question, you just came from a Bible conference. You just heard the greatest sermons in the history of the world. And it didn't sink in. It needs to sink in. You see, he told them there was going to be a very clear start and finish, just like a race. We're here, and what did Jesus? Where are we? Where did Jesus say he's going? The other side of the of the sea, six miles. That's it. There's a there's a start, and there's an end. But the in between is where we get in trouble. You see, when we come to Christ, that's the start. And we know there's an end. But it's that in-between time where the storms come in and they, they, take, they eat our lunch. The one promise is true. Then he says, I'm with you. We're, you're doing what I told you to do. And I'm with you for those six miles. Remember, Jesus also said this. He said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you're going to have what? Trouble. trouble. Everybody say trouble. 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 So, but take heart. I have overcome the world. You will have trouble. Now, the way to think about trouble is uh, if you have on a pair of pants which is a good thing. At the bottom of the leg or in the hem of your skirt, there's a hem, right? What's a hem? It's a piece of cloth that's folded over, right? And sewed, right? So it doesn't fray. I was afraid kind of guy. No, so that's what a hem is. You fold it over and you sew it in and it's not going anywhere, right? That's a hem. When it says trouble, you're hemmed in. <coughs> Life has folded over you and it's gotten sewn and there's no way out. It's like Harry Houdini, remember? Or those, they get, they put on the, you know, the handcuffs and the chains and he can't move. They put him inside of a sack. He is hemmed in. He, that's what trouble is. Trouble says there's no way out. We can't figure it out. It's tribulation, it's pressure, it's distress. We're hemmed in, we're in a tight place. Do you like being locked in a tight place? Anybody here claustrophobic like me? Yeah, it's scary, isn't it? It's not really, there's nothing coming at you, but it's the fact that you can't get out. That's what drives it. And, and, we, and there are so many of these things we hear. We hear these great words of encouragement. This is one of my favorite. When God closes a door, he opens a window. You've heard this, right? It's a lie. <laughs> this is a lie. These words, something like it, is in, in the Bible, but it's about temptation. This is talking about specifically temptation. That's in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. He says, when we are tempted, those disciples weren't being tempted. They were in a tight place. Trouble was all around them. Trouble's different than temptation. And there are no guarantees that you're going to get out of it in this life. The guarantees are with heaven. The guarantees are in all eternity. 
but there's no guarantee here because the trials that God hand delivers to us sometimes are the path we will have to walk down to learn who we're really, who we're trusting. There's no other way. There's no other way. The other day, I have computers and all sorts of technology in my office. And because I am just panicked about things that happen, all of it runs off of batteries. I bought all of these battery backup things, right? In my office, I got two big ones. One's probably enough, but I want a backup for the backup. That tells you a lot about me. Anyway, so one of these battery backups starts going beep, beep, beep. What does that mean? The battery is cuckoo. It's like the one that, it's like when your, when your fire alarm, the smoke detector goes off at 2.37 a.m. It never goes off in the day. I don't know how they build those batteries, but anyway, it's just, and it won't stop. So I unplug it and take it apart, and I then have to go to just one battery. I've lost my backup. So I go get a new battery. I go get the new battery. Really nice guy. I take it home, open it up, and at least I'm smart enough to read the directions. <laughs> because if all you do is take it out of the box and plug it in and plug everything in, guess what happens? Nothing. Because the battery's not actually connected. When it's shipped, it's not connected. On the bottom, they got this tiny little key that you got to peel off and put it in the bottom. Then everything's connected. All I had to do was look at three little illustrations. And it solved all my problems. Are we willing to listen to God's illustrations? To hear what he has to say? It will make life a lot easier. But more than making life easier, and that's a good thing. Making life, anybody want to have an easier life? You all for that? But there's something better. It pleases the one who loves us. It pleases the one. Don't you want to please the one you love? Isn't there, there's nothing you wouldn't do for the one you love. You know, think about what you do for your grandkids. You know, you would, you would turn yourself inside out. You'd stand on your head. Because you love them. And now, this is what God says, there's a path and that path may include rocky, a rocky path and a storm. But why? It's going to see, do you love me? Do we really follow, follow him? Job understood this. He's in the middle. Not at the beginning. He's in the middle of all this pain and agony. He's lost everything. He's now lost his health. And Job says, what? But he, God, that's God, knows every step I take. When God has tested me, what's going to happen? I'm going to come out as pure gold. Job says, I'm going to come out of this. Maybe in this life, but maybe not. But I'm coming out. I'm going to get through this. Because God's walking with me. God's in the boat with me. There's an old hymn that says, When through the deep waters I call thee to go, the rivers of sorrow will not overflow, for I will be near thee thy troubles to bless and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, thy grace all sufficient will be my supply. The flames shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume, thy gold to refine. 
He don't write them like that anymore. And Job understood that. The question is, are we going to understand it? I'm going to come out as pure as gold. So when he says that, he has God's promise. God says, I'm going to be with you. This is not an accident. Is anything that happened to Job an accident? No. Let me make it a little more personal. Is anything that has happened to Chet an accident? No. Well deserved at times. And maybe for you, you say, I didn't deserve it. Guess what? That's okay. Because God says, I'm going to be with you through it. Every step of the way. And maybe I'm going to bring you out of it in this life, and maybe not. But you are going to come through it. That's my promise. You can bet the bank. You can bet the farm on it. Secondly, is he says, God, there, you have a purpose. And guess what? God is not in the business of telling us what his purpose is, is all the time. He sometimes does, but there's no guarantee that we're going to know. We have, that's what faith, faith says, God, I don't understand your purpose or plan, but I trust you. And thirdly, he says, God, you do have a plan. You're going to use this for, your good, for the good of people and for your glory. I am going to do it. Think about God using the Apostle Paul. If anybody should have had, you know, a charmed life where nothing went wrong, shouldn't it have been the Apostle Paul? Yeah. I mean, he's, you know, he's, he, he walks into all these, all these towns and starts churches, and he's a great speaker and orator and doing great works for the kingdom of God. And this guy can't catch a break. He finally gets thrown in jail and everybody says, well, that's the end of him, right? Guess what? That was the making of him. Do you have a Bible? Most of the New Testament was written by Paul. And most of the most of that was written from jail. Some people have thought, well, if he wasn't in jail, he would have been too busy to sit down and write. Maybe that's true. You see, God's going to use, no matter what it is, he's going to use it for his good and for glory. Think about Luke. Luke, Luke wasn't even a, a Jew. And he's, he's hanging around Paul. Helping him, taking care of him. You got a gospel of Luke? He's the guy. He will use people like them. He'll use people like us. So Jesus, in talking, when he's talking about hard things to his disciples, he says this. He says, the one who can accept this should accept it. So how do we accept, you know, this is very unpopular. This isn't real. This isn't, a, you know, oh, a, a soft and ooey gooey uh, chocolate with a cream filled center kind of a topic. It's a hard one. But there are three things to do. First of all, God says, I want you to live for me. We need to devote ourselves to him because of how good he's been, because of who he is and all he's done. Am I living for God? Which brings us to the second thing. Am I leveraging my life? What am I doing with what I got, with the days I've got, with the energy I've got, with the resources I got? None of that is an accident. God, how can this be used for you? There's no, there should not be a fear of missing out in our lives. Thirdly, we can lean into relationships. We need each other. We need to lean in and allow people into our lives. Lean in to allow people to help. And I've asked uh, Joe, he's ha recently had a, something, if you just sh share with us. Well, I gotta, I'm going to take a little bit more time than that. Take all the time you want. All right. 
If you're late for lunch, it's his fault, not mine. Anyway, uh, Chad asked me to talk about uh, a group of friends that came over and, and uh, put, uh, laid hands on me for healing for my back. But I'm going to regress a little bit, back about 40 years. Elaine's best friend, I was in the hospital, couldn't walk, had a tumor in her back. And the doctor uh, was going to have surgery the next day. So that and I, at that time, I was a Christian for about maybe two or three years, maybe about that. Um, and we decided we were going to go over and uh, we were going to lay hands on her and pray, which we did. The next morning, the doctor came in and said, well, I'm going to do another MRI just to make sure that when I do the surgery, that the tumor hasn't moved. Well, he came back and he's white. He just, he said, I don't understand the tumor is gone, taken away. She's still, she's still alive today and uh, walking around until just recently and she's now uh, uh, quite a bit older. Anyway, that's one instance. A few years later, we had a young man that was in a prayer group with us and he was, um, he was diagnosed with uh, uh, stage four <coughs> testicular, testicular cancer. I wasn't there for the time that they prayed over him, but a group of the, from the church prayed over him, and that cancer was taken away. Mm -hmm. Now, God doesn't, I, I believe God answers all prayers, but he doesn't necessarily answer them in the way that we want, and sometimes he does healing, sometimes he doesn't. Anyway, to get to my story a little bit, uh, about five weeks ago, I was pulling brush out, cutting brush out of the front yard, and Whatever I did, I completely took my back out. And for the next four weeks, basically, I, I mean, when I get out of bed, I had to hold on to something to take the next step. I had a walker. I couldn't hardly walk. Um, and it wasn't getting any better. And um, I have a group of friends that we were in a Bible study together with. They came over, to, and this is all about trust and all about um, over the years, I have learned through all these different things to trust God. Whether I get an answer right now or I don't get an answer right now, it's immaterial. That I trust in Him for the answers for my life. They, uh, a group of my friends came over, and uh, unbeknown to me, actually just walked in the door and said, we're going to pray for you. Put, laid hands on me, prayed. The next day, I got up out of bed, and I believe me, I, was, I didn't even want to get out of bed because I knew that first step was going to be awful. I got out of bed and walked up to the living room, got a cup of coffee, went and sat down. My back was about 90% better. Uh, and that was just, that's just the, 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 the power that God has. And I believe there's power when Christians get together and they lay hands on you and pray. But there's a, a power beyond the prayers that you can just do yourself. So that anyway, I hope that was that's great. what we were talking about. Yeah, that's great. Thank right. you. That's it. Thank you. And you see he's walking. He walked up here without a I walker. I walked up. Yeah. So. Thank you. See, sometimes God does that. Sometimes he doesn't. Yep. And the good news is that God hasn't moved. God hasn't changed. There are some things God can't do. I know that's an odd thing to say because everybody says God can do anything, right? No, that is another lie. God can't do certain things. God can't lie. God can't change. God can't stop loving you in Jesus Christ. He can't. And he won't. So in response to him, let's live for him. I don't know how many days you got, how many days I've got. Let's make them all count. Secondly, let's leverage what God has given you. You have got skill, you've got talent, you've got abilities. Marianne, my dear wife, I told you, she goes over two days a week, she's retired. Is that stopping her? Heck no. She's back in that school system tutoring first graders reading. She has got a talent, she's got a passion to do that. Use it. Lean, and lean, we need to lean on one another. It makes, it is so touching to me 
when people call or text me or send me an email and say, I need help. What a privilege it is to receive that. What a privilege it is to then pray with them. What a privilege it is to I just write a prayer and send it to them. I'll never be able to do that unless somebody tells me. Same with you. Be on the receiving side, be on the sending side. Let us, let's lean on one another because Jesus came so that we could be restored to God and we could lean on him forever. Would you pray with me? Our Father and our God, I thank you that you are the King, you are the Lord, the God of, of all eternity. And you have made us to lean on you. You have made us in Christ to be restored to you. And we are to lean on one another. I thank you that you send the storms. They're not fun, but when we come out, we will be like gold in this life and then through all eternity. Forgive us when we complain about the storm you've sent. Let us learn the lessons. Be the people that it would stick in us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, thank you all.